Cooper the frog. After our home was destroyed by the hurricane, my family moved to San Diego, maybe because it was as far away from Miami as we could get. Finally this evening, saving our seas. The federal government has released a major assessment on the oceans. The news is not good. It's going to be tough to drive this summer. Gas prices are expected to soar even higher. Increased heat speeds up evaporation cycles. The impact of these changes can be scientists report from the Arctic. The tundra is thawing faster than expected. The United Nations announced today that there are now 8 billion people living on Earth. It's amazing what you can come to take for normal. By the time I was in my 20s, shortages and higher prices were just a fact of everyday life. After high school, I decided to train as an EMT. I wanted to be useful, and this seemed the perfect kind of work. So what else will be normal in 2030? One thing, it will be warmer, about one and a half degrees Fahrenheit warmer, enough to dramatically alter the planet's weather and rainfall. Canada and Siberia, for example, will be wetter and hotter. But for much of the world, rain will be scarce, and so will its most basic need, water. By 2030, two-thirds of the world's population will be under water stress. In Asia, for example, glaciers on the Tibetan Plateau act as a giant reservoir for billions of people. All over the world, as the climate warms, mountain glaciers are melting at faster and faster rate. By 2030, 80% of those glaciers may be gone. If the glaciers disappear, much of the food supply will disappear as well. These glaciers provide stream flow in the summer during the dry months that you can use to irrigate your crops. When those glaciers are gone, you've got a massive drought situation. In 2030, Africa could be facing extreme and widespread drought. Rainfall levels are going to continue to drop over time in Africa, especially in these fragile regions like the Sahel. When the rains fail and people don't have enough to eat, they often turn to desperate means to survive. And in the U.S., in 2030, many of the massive reservoirs fed by the Colorado River will be drying up. We talk about the Southwest moving into drought as, as a way to, to describe what's going to happen, but technically, the Southwest, it's not going to be in drought. It's going to become a desert. In San Diego, they were ahead of the game. In 2009, they had started building huge desalination plants. It took 20 years and cost billions of dollars, but it worked. The massive plants on the ocean turned salt water into fresh, and the city's water supply was restored. 400 miles inland, though, they were running out, and no one had enough money to build a pipe that long. So now we're here rationing water. I mean, people in Las Vegas are starting to totally panic. People in Phoenix are starting to panic, too. When I turn on my tap this morning, this is what I get out of my tap. Something that will catch people's attention is the first city, rich city in the world, that just runs out of water. Three days after Tucson's taps ran dry, its parked residents finally got relief when a convoy of National Guard tanker trucks carrying one million gallons of water finally arrived. Anxious residents lined up to get their allotment. What happened there scared the whole country. In San Diego, when the private companies who desalinated our water used Tucson as an excuse and jacked up our water prices, I decided enough was enough. I went to a rally. A man standing next to me saw me yelling and said, I'm glad you're on our side. To make a short story even shorter, we fell in love on the spot. Two months later, Josh and I were married. A year later, our daughter Molly was born with a head full of red hair. 
and the desalination companies, they backed down. We had won. Josh and I had friends who, like us, were determined to reimagine the future. We were all of us optimists. Some of us worked on solar plants in the desert. Others tinkered with super efficient cars in their garages. Still others designed fantastical cities on their computers. It was an exciting time to be young. But it was becoming clear that the problems of the world knew no borders. Global population is now approaching 9 billion. It seems unlikely to me that we here in America can sit happily with all of our resources while the rest of the world simply goes quietly into that good night. Very few people lay down and die. When they recognize that their lives are threatened, they do whatever it takes. Hundreds of thousands of environmental refugees fleeing drought and famine are streaming toward Europe. They will move across borders by the droves, by the millions, and uh, that will be something we've never seen before. And I, that might be the thing that we'll find the most difficult to cope with. From Laredo to Tijuana, millions of Latin Americans are massing along the U.S. border. You'll see intense pressure for people to move and be on the move from the Caribbean, uh, from Latin America, from Mexico in particular, uh, into the United States. And that'll put huge stress, I think, on, on the systems of the United States to try to cope with that. I can't imagine the horrors that will take place on the border as millions of refugees try to get into the United States. I was working the midnight shift when a call came from the border police. Be careful, Josh said. This doesn't sound good. Thousands of refugees had been arriving at the border, desperate for water and food. Someone had blown a hole through the wall, and thousands of people were streaming through. They had called in the border police. I don't know how it started, who fired first. But suddenly, the police were shooting into the crowd. There were people falling, panic everywhere. Josh heard it on the news, and how he found me in the midst of all that chaos, I'll never know. In San Diego, Josh and Molly and I took long walks on the beach to look for birds. Over the years, our favorites started to disappear. The worst was the end of the albatross. These marvelous birds had finally been done in by fishermen's long lines. It was a bad omen for the rest of us. Probably a third of all species will be on an inexorable path to extinction by 2050. They will include familiar species like lions and tigers and bears, but there will also be huge areas of the planet which presently are really lovely and beautiful and diverse. Those places will have essentially disappeared. In the history of the Earth, there have been five mass extinctions in which at least half the species on Earth disappeared. They were caused by natural disasters, massive volcanic eruptions, rapid climate change, meteors hitting the Earth. Today, in the 21st century, we are in the midst of what scientists are calling the sixth extinction. And for the first time, it is being caused by a single species, us. When one species proliferates beyond any other, ultimately it sort of knocks out its own life support systems and it collapses. And in a way, that's what we're doing at every level around the world. Today in 2009, the idea that we could do so much damage to our natural environment that it could cause our global civilization to collapse may seem far-fetched. Think of all the signs of normalcy. 